Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another webinar in our Get Ahead of Lead webinar series. Today's topic is safe work practices in New York City, knowing when and how to use certified contractors when working with lead-based paint. My name is Jesse Laufer. I'm gonna be your main presenter for the bulk of the presentation. I'm a trainer in HPD's Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services. We are also joined by Shireen Riazi Kermani. She is the lead compliance officer also with uh, the Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services. Uh, Shireen, you wanna say hi? Hi, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to answering your questions later when we get to the question and answer period. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shireen. Uh, before we get into our content, we have a couple administrative items to uh, discuss. If you're joining us on a laptop or a desktop um, computer, you should see a, a control panel, something like this. There may be a, if you don't see this, you uh, may only see this little piece of the panel. It may have docked to the right side of your screen. You can click this arrow to expand this. Uh, just to point out, we have a couple handouts available for you to download. Um, there is a guide to local L1 work practices, and there's also a sample record keeping form. Uh, we'll mention those uh, throughout the presentation, but these are also available for download uh, from the HPD website, the lead based page, page uh, of the HPD website. So if you don't uh, download them now, or if you're on a mobile device, they're always available at a later date. Uh, there's also, I want to just also highlight this questions tab and Again, for these, you may have to click uh, the little arrow to expand it. Um, questions, or it may be called chat, depending on your platform, that will allow you to uh, submit questions to us. Let us know if, also if you're having technical difficulties. Um, in that way, we can understand if multiple people are having technical difficulties. Uh, but we, and, and we encourage you to ask the questions uh, as they come up. Don't save them till the end to type in. We usually get uh, quite a, a number of questions right at the end so it's easier uh, for our folks to um, organize the questions as they come in. So certainly submit them as you have them um, and it'll be easier for us to get to your question. Uh, we're gonna keep questions uh, or we're gonna answer questions that are focused on safe work practices. That will allow, uh, if hopefully we'll have enough time to get to all the questions that come in, uh, we'll do our best. Um, but if the question is uh, off topic, we likely won't be able to get to it. Um, and speaking of questions, you may have heard that the definition of lead-based paint will be changing under Local Law 1. Uh, a proposed rule was posted and a hearing held in July of this year, 2021, regarding this. Uh, and currently the city is still reviewing comments and has not published a final rule. So more information about the proposed rule, it's, it's available on the HPD website and that's where uh, updates will also be. Um, so if you have questions about that, we've we won't really be able to provide more information beyond what is uh, in the uh, information that's on the, the website. If you are joining us on a mobile platform, uh, this is what your interface looks like. Uh, it still has the same functions. You can find the handouts. You can uh, ask the questions. Um, you just have to find out where these functions are depending on your platform. And you may have to tap the screen, uh, give it a single tap to bring the buttons up if you don't see the buttons right now. After the webinar, there will be a, uh, there's a short survey that will automatically launch. That'll be after our Q&A. Um, we read all the responses to that. Uh, it's just, it just take a minute or so. Um, let us know uh, how we did, where we might be able to improve. Um, and we use that information to uh, improve future webinar offerings. Within about 24 hours, you'll receive a video recording of this session uh, via email. There's an automated email that gets sent out by the webinar platform. Uh, so you can go back and review this. Um, and then shortly thereafter, uh, the video will also be posted on the HPD website. Uh, if you're joining us through the HPD website and just watching a recording, as I said, all the handouts that we are gonna discuss uh, are available on that website. And our final administrative piece here is uh, a quick disclaimer that this presentation is for informational purposes only, and it does not constitute legal advice. This presentation is not a complete statement of building owners' responsibilities relating to lead-based paint or any other topic. Uh, our target audience are building owners with some basic familiarity. Uh, hopefully you've seen some of our previous webinars, either live or uh, the recorded ones posted on the website. 
And so we're assuming that you have, if, you, if this is the first time you're joining us, uh, if some of the information we go over um, isn't, uh, you're not familiar with, please see the previous uh, webinar recordings that we have on the website for more information on that. Our topic today is New York City's Local Law 1 of 2004 and its amendments. Uh, there are federal regulations concerning safe work practices that will be mentioned in this presentation, uh, but we'll be focusing on the safe work practices required under Local Law 1. And finally, this presentation is intended as a general guide on providing, uh, providing basic information on using safe work practices to correct lead-based paint hazards and to comply with local, law, local and federal regulations. Uh, owners must carefully read HPD and EPA guides and materials and use their own judgment to adapt the suggestions and principles in this webinar in order to comply with the law. Now onto our content. We're going to start with uh, a review of owner's responsibilities under Local Law 1. If you have seen some of our other webinars, uh, some of this stuff may be familiar, but it certainly bears repeating some of the main ideas, the key concepts within Local Law 1. Then we're going to get into talking about the basics of safe work practices, working with certified professionals and what to be looking for there, uh, record keeping, so how to document all of this activity. We'll end with a few final notes before getting to our question and answers. Uh, but first, let's stop uh, for a second and do a quick poll um, just to see who uh, has attended one of these uh, webinars before. So let me launch this poll here. And you should see the poll appear on your screen. Um, there are a couple different options for the yes, um, that you've attended a live webinar just like this one. You've uh, only watched the online recordings. Uh, you've done both or no, this is your first time. So let's see uh, what kind of uh, mix we have of uh, new and repeat uh, clients out there. I'll leave this open for just another few seconds. And I'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. And let me share the results. Uh, I'm a little, ple I'm pleasantly surprised. It looks like about two thirds are here for the first time. Um, so again, if uh, we go over some material that isn't uh, familiar to you, please visit the HPD website. I'm going to, you're going to see the link to that a number of times throughout this presentation. Uh, there are recordings of other uh, webinars that we've done previously about other aspects of Local Law 1 of New York City's lead law. So there's a wealth of information there, and I encourage you to go uh, check that out if this, was your, um, if this is your first uh, webinar. And even if it's not your first webinar, if you haven't watched them all, uh, certainly there's more information there to learn. All right, so let's get into uh, the owner's responsibilities under Local Law 1. So a key concept within Local Law 1 is the presumption of lead-based paint. Which buildings uh, do we have to presume that the paint in them is lead-based paint? It's based on when lead-based paint was banned in New York City. So that happened in New York City in January 1st, 1960. And so that date you're going to see appear a lot within Local Law 1. Also worth mentioning that the nationwide ban on lead-based paint happened uh, January 1st, 1978. So a number of years later, that date is also going to be important. So under Local Law 1, uh, paint is presumed to be lead-based paint if the building was built prior to that ban date, January 1st, 1960. Also, a child under six years old resides in the unit. And keep in mind that resides means lives or routinely spends 10 or more hours per week. And then the third criteria uh, is that the building is either a multiple dwelling, which is three or more residential units, or a private dwelling with a tenant-occupied unit. So basically all, uh, all rental units, um, aside from private dwellings where all of the units within the private dwelling are occupied by an owner or their family. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, private dwellings, uh, as of February 11th, 2021, all provisions of Local Law 1 now apply to private dwellings. The law expanded to cover private dwellings. Previously, only turnover requirements uh, applied to private dwellings. So 
as of early this year, all provisions of Local Law 1 apply to private dwellings. Another key idea within Local Law 1 is what is and is not a violation. So just having lead-based paint in, in a unit, um, a residential unit, is not a violation. Local Law 1 focuses on lead paint hazards. And so lead paint that's under layers of intact non-lead paint is not an immediate danger. It becomes a problem when a leak occurs, when damage to the wall occurs, and now you have exposed lead paint. So the law concerns itself with uh, deteriorated paint. These are the hazards we're talking about. It also concerns itself with uh, high-risk surfaces. So the law focuses on high-risk surfaces, uh, specifically doors and windows, the friction surfaces there. The paint may not look deteriorated, but you have surfaces that are rubbing against each other, uh, what's called friction surfaces, and that produces dust. And if it's lead paint that's on those components, now you have lead paint dust, even though it doesn't look like your traditional uh, peeling paint. And as we mentioned already, the law also uh, applies almost always where a child under six years old resides. I'll just mention here very briefly that the turnover requirements uh, do apply uh, regardless of the child under six um, requirement. So a child under six living there. Um, so we're not going to discuss turnover here, but please see that other webinar for more information about that. So some of the actions that an owner must take under Local Law 1, there are actions to prevent lead paint hazards. So doing uh, what's called the annual notice which is reaching out to tenants and asking them, figuring out where in, your, in the building uh, children under six are residing. And that can help to guide investigations that have to happen, at, again, at least annually, in those units uh, to identify lead paint hazards. Then there's also a, the turnover investigation that I just mentioned. So that's when the apartment is vacant, uh, someone's moving out, someone else is moving in. At that point, uh, the unit needs to be uh, inspected for, uh, the owner has to inspect and see if there are any uh, hazards that need to be addressed. There are other turnover responsibilities as well. Uh, as I said, we have a webinar devoted to that. So make sure you watch that one if you're not familiar with those requirements. In addition to preventing lead paint hazards, owners also have to correct hazards when they exist. So that means remediating and abating lead paint hazards that are found during that annual investigation, during turnover, or if a tenant makes a complaint directly to an owner or one of their staff, uh, makes a complaint through 311 to HPD. And in that correction, owners have to use EPA certified contractors who follow safe work practices. And that's gonna be our, uh, the focus of this presentation here. We're gonna expand on that, but as a quick summary, that any work disturbing more than two square feet or 10% of a small component um, of lead-based paint or paint of unknown lead content is gonna require these safe work practices. And those have to be performed by EPA certified contractors. And this is on work that's to address lead paint hazards, but also other repair work, renovation work, any routine work that's gonna disturb that amount of paint or more. So let's get into talking about these safe work practices. Uh, in order to do so, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, levels of government that have requirements for safe work practices. So both the federal government and the local New York City government have uh, laws governing safe work practices. The federal government, the US government has laws that apply across the country. Remember. Lead-based paint, lead paint was banned nationwide in 1978. So the federal requirements require safe work practices to be used in housing built before 1978. And there's no age provisions uh, with the federal requirements. New York City uh, has some additional stricter requirements for units built before 1960 and where a child under the age of six resides. It's worth noting that in that 
interim period, 1960 to 1978. If lead paint, lead-based paint is known to exist in a building that was built in that period, uh, then these requirements apply because that building has lead-based paint. Even though it was banned in New York City um, in residential settings, lead-based paint was available in neighboring states just a bridge or a tunnel away, and it was used in the city. There are situations where buildings that were built after 1960, before 1978, uh, are found to have lead-based paint. So if that's the case, um, now these requirements apply to that building. And as I said, this webinar is focusing on the safe work practices uh, required under New York City's law, Local Law 1. Uh, we're going to continue mentioning some of the federal uh, requirements for safe work practices, but owners should make sure to do their own research to ensure they're complying with all applicable laws. So generally, what are safe work practices? What are the key ideas for uh, the requirement of using safe work practices? Uh, they are requirements for the work area meant to protect workers and building occupants. There are some work methods that are acceptable and others that are not allowed, that are prohibited. And then once work is complete, there is a testing process to ensure that there's no contamination left behind because this work produces dust, as does any uh, work, uh, renovation and repair work. And we want to make sure that any lead contaminated dust has been properly cleaned. So some acceptable work methods you will see. Uh, certainly you're going to see uh, a bunch of signage alerting people that are coming into the building of the potential hazard and where it is. You're going to see a lot of plastic sheeting. You're going to see it over uh, registers, over doorways, maybe some windows, over the floors. There's lots of nice old wooden floors in New York City, um, but they have lots of gaps and cracks, and so we don't want lead dust getting in there and slowly uh, coming out over time. So you're going to see sheeting over floors. Also, Take note of this entryway that allows workers to put on and take off their uh, PPE in a contained space. You're going to see wet methods being used uh, that helps to contain and minimize dust, make dust heavier so it falls to the ground faster. Uh, you're not going to see dry sanding, for example, uh, or you should not. And if you do, uh, the job should be stopped. Um, it is, that's a way to distribute lead contaminated dust throughout the room, throughout the unit. And so uh, wet methods are required. And then there's some daily cleanup activities that are required as well. As I mentioned uh, just now, you were not gonna see, these are prohibited work methods. So you're not gonna see dry scraping or sanding, uh, any open flame burning that can produce a lead contaminated vapor. Um, so those are, are not allowed. The dangers of not using safe work practices uh, include exposure uh, to children uh, and, and adults and workers uh, doing, doing the, that work um, to lead contaminated dust. Um, certainly, if someone who is untrained in working with lead-based paint uh, tries to correct a lead hazard, uh, it's very likely that they can make the situation worse by cutting plaster uh, and, and scraping and sanding, and uh, that's going to create a much larger hazard, spread dust, contam potentially contaminated dust um, throughout a wider area than the original uh, hazard may uh, have originally um, created. So certainly you have to use uh, trained professionals to keep all that dust, all the lead contamination contained. There are local and feder federal enforcement agencies. Um, that come along with financial penalties, so HPD, uh, Department of Buildings, Department of Health, Health and Mental Hygiene at the New York City level, the EPA at the federal level, um, are all uh, involved in enforcing these rules. And then tenants also may initiate legal action uh, if safe work practices are not file, followed in, uh, in their unit or in their building. So where must safe work practices be used? In all buildings constructed before 1978. So this is, uh, this is a spot where let's, let's highlight a, the federal requirement, which is 
uh, that this is where safe work practices have to be used in all buildings before 1978. Uh, you remember the New York City requirement. It focuses on local law one focused on buildings built before 1960 um, or buildings between 1960 and 1978 if lead-based paint is known to exist. But you might say, my building was built in 1975, and so, and I don't know that there's, I have no knowledge of lead-based paint in my building. Um, under the New York City's law, maybe uh, safe work practices wouldn't be required, but if you didn't use them, you'd be violating federal requirements. So if you want to keep it simple, have one set of guidelines, then all buildings pre-1978, built before 1978, is where safe work practices need to be used. When must safe work practices be used? For any work that disturbs, disturbs more than two square feet or 10% of a small component of lead-based paint or paint of unknown lead content. And this is uh, in a single room. And this can be a combination, two areas that are being worked on um, that are each a square foot. Add that together, that's two square feet in a room. This applies. Uh, this is the requirement under Local Law 1. The federal requirement is six square feet, but again, if you want to keep it simple, one set of guidelines, safe work practices need to be used in pre-1978 buildings where you're disturbing more than two square feet of paint uh, or 10% of a small component. And just to give a couple examples of small components, you might have door casing as is, is shown here, um, window sills, uh, baseboards, Things like that uh, are what we're considering small components. Also, just pointing out that any work really means any work. General maintenance work, it's not just dealing with HPD violations for lead paint, lead base paint hazards, things like that. Uh, any work that's disturbing uh, more than two square feet requires safe work practices to be used. Now, who must perform these safe work practices? mentioned it already, it's trained and certified professionals. Uh, it's not uh, the time to get John or Jane Super from down the block to come and fix the plaster um, and repaint. If the criteria that we just reviewed apply to, to the building, um, then safe work practices need to be used. Generally, that's going to be contractors that have been certified, uh, certified by the EPA. Though there is an option to get yourself or building staff certified uh, to do this work. And so now in this next section, uh, in the next section, we'll talk about those certified professionals. Uh, but before that, let's do one more quick poll. So when was your building built? If you uh, are a building owner or manager, and you have more than one building that's in your portfolio, um, just pick the oldest building and let us know. Uh, if you're a tenant and you know, then you can tell us when your building was built. Um, otherwise, you can let us know that you don't know, and that's okay, but it's certainly something to look into. Because unless it's a fairly new building, uh, these may apply. These rules may apply. Uh, we have about half of the responses in, so I'll, I'll leave it open for another uh, couple seconds. And I'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. And let me share the results with everyone. So we have a uh, majority of uh, our attendees today have buildings built before 1960. So in that case, New York City and federal lead rules apply to your buildings. That second choice between 1960 and 1978, some New York City rules and all federal rules are going to apply to your building. A small percentage have buildings built after January 1st, 1978, and so the lead rules do not apply. There was a nationwide ban, and so those lead rules do not apply. All right, now let's get into working with certified professionals. In order to discuss the types of certification, we need to talk about the types of work that, is, that can be done. And there are two categories of work. 
The first category that we're going to discuss are general repairs and renovation. This is most of the work that's going to be done uh, in a unit. It's work that might disturb lead paint or paint of unknown lead content. And then the other category of work is abatement work. And this is work that is intended specifically to remove lead-based paint. So that's a fairly narrow category of work. Everything else is, falls under the general repair and renovation. These two different types of work will require contractors that have two different types of certifications. One will be a renovation certification, and another one will be an abatement certification. And we're going to see uh, some details about that in just a moment. But before that, let's see uh, a few more details about these uh, different categories of work. As I said, general repair and renovation work is any work that the general work that will disturb lead paint or paint of unknown lead content. Uh, that also includes remediation work to correct lead-based paint hazards that are found uh, by the owner during their investigations, so the annual inspection, turnover, things like that. It will also include, uh, for example, um, repairs to a leaky pipe behind a wall. Again, if more than two square feet of paint is being disturbed by that plumber, that plumber needs to have that renovation certification. And we'll, again, we'll talk more specifically about the certification in just a moment. Um, or an electrician that's uh, replacing old wiring in a room and is tearing up some of the wall in order to do so. If it, again, if it's more than two square feet, they have to be certified to perform the safe work practices under the renovation certification. Abatement work, again, to repeat, is the permanent elimination. It's intended to remove lead-based paint uh, permanently from a unit or from a component. This might be where a uh, an owner uh, does testing in a unit and finds lead-based paint and wants it removed. Uh, there's also certain provisions under Local Law 1 that require abatement work. Um, during turnover, certain uh, aspects of dealing with doors and windows, friction surfaces require uh, an abatement uh, certification, a contractor with an abatement certification. Um, dealing with HPD violations for lead-based paint um, will require that. So keep that in mind that there um, are some situations that will require abatement work under the law. A special, a couple of special circumstances to discuss here. Um, if you're doing general repair and renovation work and it's a larger job, and by larger job we mean, or the law means, disturbing more than 10 square feet of lead-based paint or paint of unknown lead content, uh, or removing two or more windows that are painted with lead-based paint or paint of unknown lead content. Um, these larger jobs are going to require a contractor that is certified to perform that abatement work, an abatement certification. It also will require that renovation requirement. So this is a case where a contractor is going to need both require both certifications in order to perform this work. Hi, Jesse. It's Shireen. Sorry to jump yep. in here, but I think you said Please. 10 square feet. So I wanted to um, make sure that it's 100 square feet. What we're talking oh. about is 100 square feet. And I just want to make sure in case we're folks were not seeing the screen and just listening to the audio. It's if you disturb more than 100 square feet. And that is also, as was mentioned earlier, in a room. So it's more than 100 square feet in a room, just for clarification. OK, thank you, Shireen. Sorry about that, uh, that speech typo there. Um, so yes, 100 square feet, not 10 square feet. So again, as a reminder, all workers who do the general repair and renovation work or abatement work uh, need to be trained and certified to perform uh, safe work practices. So now let's look at what uh, some specifics of those certifications. So the first certification, this is for that renovation work that we were talking about. Uh, this is uh, a renovation, repair, and painting certification is the official name, but you may hear it referred to as uh, a renovation certification um, or a firm referred to itself as a renovator firm. You may hear it also as a lead safe certification. Um, you'll see this EPA lead safe 
um, logo uh, on the on this certification. Uh, but this is part of the renovation, repair, and painting um, program through the EPA. That's the certification. One thing to mention is that RRP firms, this renovation firm, uh, they cannot do abatement work unless they also have that abatement certification, what was discussed uh, briefly on the previous slide. Different types of work, um, sometimes that overlaps and both uh, certifications are going to be necessary for a firm to have. Similarly, abatement firms with an abatement certification uh, can't do this renovation work unless they also have this renovation or RRP certification. And Jesse, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to, I thought it would be good to answer one question that we got since we were looking at the screen. Jana's had a question asking if only painting, no repairs, what type of contractor can be used? And to answer your question, Janice and anyone else, that is the RRP um, certification that we're looking at here. So I'm not sure what you meant by repairs, but basically if you're hiring a contractor to go in and do painting, you're assuming that they're going to be disturbing more than two square feet of paint just through sanding and any sort of work that they're doing for prepping. Hire an RRP contractor and make sure that they have their RRP certification. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you, Shireen. No problem. And just an another plug for getting those questions in as, as they come up, type them in, and maybe it'll get answered even before we get to the Q&A. All right, let's take a look at the other certification type for the other work type for abatement work. So this is the abatement certification, um, as it's, us it's usually called, um, but more officially, it's the lead-based paint activities certification and the language within this certificate, this EPA certificate, is to conduct lead-based paint activities. Um, so those are the two uh, names you may hear uh, for this. Uh, it's important to mention that this is not a higher certification than RRP. Again, they are different certifications for different work. Um, and sometimes, based on the, uh, the, the legal requirements, uh, a contractor may need to have both certifications in order to perform certain work. Um, also, another reminder is that these certifications uh, can be at both the firm and the worker level. So a, a contracting firm that's hired to do some work should be certified, and then each worker that's in a unit or in a building doing the work needs to have their own certification. And so proprietorships need both the firm and worker certifications. This is also the certification that a risk assessor or lead inspector will have, and those are the uh, certified contractors that can perform XRF testing to determine if paint is lead-based paint or not. So this is, uh, you'll be looking out for this if you ever do uh, lead-based paint testing, XRF testing. So now we've talked about the work, the certifications needed to perform the work. Um, the contractor finishes the work, they do their cleaning. We wanna make sure, the law wants to make sure that the area is now safe for occupants to reoccupy. And so clearance measures are required to, to, to clear the area, make sure it is safe to reoccupy. Specifically, they're looking for uh, lead contaminated dust and making sure that was properly cleaned. Under Local Law 1, these clearance measures are required for both the general repair work and abatement work. Under federal law, it's only for abatement work, but again, if you wanna keep it simple, uh, and remember one set of guidelines, for both of these work types, whenever an EPA certified contractor is doing work, after they are finished, a, an EPA uh, certified contractor needs to come in to do this clearance testing. Let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of this clearance testing. They come and they take samples of the dust from the floor, and from parts of the windows to see if there is lead contamination uh, above a certain threshold as described in the law, as specified in the law. The contractor doing this dust analysis needs to be independent of the owner, independent of the contractor who performed the work. We wouldn't want the contractor, the law doesn't want the contractor doing their own dust wipe samplings, their own clearance measures, uh, that's basically grading your own tests, if you will. 
And so it's got to be an independent firm using an independent lab to do that analysis of the dust wipes to see what the lead levels are in those wipes. So again, this is just to make sure that the uh, area has been cleaned properly uh, before it can be reoccupied. Just a couple more details about dust wipes. So that sampling can't be done. Those dust wipes uh, can't be, samples can't be taken until at least an hour after the final cleaning has finished. That will allow the dust to settle. Tenants can't permanently reoccupy until the lab analysis comes back and shows that contamination is below a, uh, the threshold described in the law. Um, one note here is that the thresholds in local law one, so New York City's law, are lower than the federal threshold. So make sure your contractor is following local law one's thresholds. And as I mentioned before, that the dust web contractor and the lab have to be independent of the owner and the contractor that did the work. One other recent note is that as of June 1st, 2021, these thresholds uh, for dust wipe clearance were lowered. Uh, so you can see information about that on HPD and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's uh, lead web pages. Finding these contractors um, and finding uh, contractors who can do the clearance testing uh, are all available uh, through search tools on the EPA website epa.gov forward slash lead. Go into information, there's links. There are two separate tools that look very similar, but one is focused on the RRP certification and the other is focused on that lead-based paint activities uh, or also known as abatement certification. And that's where you'll find abatement firms. You'll also find the risk assessors and lead inspectors that can do dust wipes. Now let's talk about record keeping. Once you've done all this work, you need to document it, make sure it's available um, to show that this work was done properly. So New York City law requires owners to keep these records for at least 10 years. Uh, this is for all lead-based paint activity. So not just responding to an HPD lead paint violation, um, but the routine repair, repainting, uh, if it requires an EPA certified contractor to do safe work practices, this it needs to be documented. There is a full record keeping webinar that we've done uh, that's available on the uh, HPD lead based paint webpage. You see the URL here. You're going to see it a number of times again uh, before the end of this um, presentation. Uh, so please review that for additional information about the record keeping requirements under local law one. Uh, some of the items you will want when you're documenting these safe work practices uh, that you'll want to keep, I should say, are the certifications or copies of the certifications uh, from the firms, from the people who perform the work, and from the uh, contractor that performed the dust wipe sampling. You're also going to want some sworn the sworn statements from them. Uh, that's going to include information like the start and end date of the work, uh, contact information for the firm, and uh, they're attesting to having used safe work practices. Uh, you can you can find samples of these. There are forms uh, on the HPD lead-based paint website that are used um, for responding to violations, but they can be used as a uh, directly or as a template. Also, uh, even if you're not responding to violations and you are just doing the work with safe work practices. Some other items you'll want: uh, descriptions of work done in each room or invoices um, from contractors. La the laboratory results from that dust wipe sampling. If occupants are temporarily um, going back into an area to, you know, to get something, um, there are some check. There's a checklist that needs to be followed in the health code as well. Um, that's again before that dust wipe sampling is done and comes back as passed to allow for permanent reoccupancy. Some additional documents uh, that aren't uh, directly listed here, but um, if you are doing, and I'll correct myself here, uh, again, over 100 square feet of paint being disturbed, if your work uh, is more than 100 square feet of paint being disturbed, or two or more windows are being removed, um, or you're responding to a violation, it's gonna require abatement work, 
and that's going to require uh, some additional documentation and um, filings with Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So what do you do if you're starting to sweat right now? I don't have 10 years worth of documentation for my building. Um, some steps here to take uh, to get yourself in compliance as quickly as possible is to compile records that you do have. That includes repair records um, and testing records of uh, any work that has been done previously. If HPD selects your building for an audit, uh, you may receive a violation if you don't have these records. Audits uh, for lead compliance are, they're, they're, there's, it's a random selection, but it's weighted toward areas that have more lead. And it may include an on-site inspection. Um, and so like any HPD violation, you're going to be given the opportunity to uh, correct it. And with regard to uh, keeping records, that's going to be maintaining records for a certain period of time to show that you are um, demonstrating proper record keeping. Also, it's worth noting that when purchasing a building, you want to inquire about these lead paint records, uh, the 10 years of records. There are uh, some statements and affidavits that can be filled out if an owner doesn't have those, but certainly it's something to inquire about and collect when you purchase a building. And it's also something to keep in mind when you're selling a building, having these records and having them organized will add value to your building. Um, it may uh, worry potential buyers if these records are not available. So certainly something that can impact the value of a building and something to keep in mind. HPD does have a sample uh, record keeping form for documenting safe work practices. It's important to note that this is only a tool and it's not something that's required by law. It's not something that we would be asking uh, you uh, to provide if, uh, for example, an audit uh, came around. If you have the records kept other, in other ways, that's okay. But this is something that um, will help to guide that documentation. It also is something that will help uh, you to understand New York City's laws if you use this. And so these can be adapted uh, as needed. They are available, this, this form for safe work practices um, and other forms for other aspects of um, documenting lead-based paint requirements under Local Law 1 are available on the HPD lead-based paint uh, webpage. It's also in the handouts if you're joining us for the live webinar here. You can download this form. Let's take a quick look at it. Um, and so this is a form for documenting areas uh, in a building, either apartments or common areas, and the criteria that we discussed about whether safe work practices are necessary or not, and then the follow-up. Uh, so just to zoom in a little here, this first section discusses um, exemption. And so in this case, all of our samples here are not exempt. And then is there a child under six that resides? Yes, uh, it's disturbing more than two square feet in a room. Yes, and that's going to require uh, safe work practices, uh, dust wipe follow-up, uh, sorry, dust wipe clearance uh, after the work is done, and follow up with the tenant if it is a uh, if it if it's a residential unit as opposed to a common area. So this not only can guide your record keeping, but also uh, help remind you about what is required under the law. So certainly use this and adapt this. Um, as necessary for your situation, for your building. And a couple final notes to discuss here. Um, this is a uh, just a bit of a reminder. Owners, uh, as of a year ago, had five, have five years to complete testing of lead-based paint in all residential units. So we're one year into that. So by August 2025, this testing uh, needs to be complete. Uh, if a child under six comes to reside in a unit, the testing has to be done within one year of that move-in date. Or if we're in the final year of this five-year period, uh, before that August 2025 deadline. And also, because you'll be doing this testing anyway, uh, keep exemption in mind. And so let's briefly talk about exemption. We have a whole other webinar devoted to exemption. Um, this is a process by which pre-1960 
um, units or buildings can demonstrate through extensive testing that there is uh, that lead-based paint is not present and therefore reduce some of the obligations under the law. Um, so things like not having to do turnover work or the annual notice and some record keeping uh, requirements can be alleviated and, and specific to our talk here is reduced or eliminated safe work practice requirements. There are two tiers of exemption that can be granted. So that's going to determine the um, amount that these of, of benefit, the extent of these benefits. So please, if you haven't already and you're not familiar, uh, check out the exemption webinar to understand since you're going to be doing that testing already. Also, as mentioned earlier, the city is still reviewing comments and has not yet published a final rule regarding the change to the definition of lead-based paint under Local Law 1. Uh, this threshold change, if it goes into effect, will it uh, affect exemptions and safe work practices. Um, so again, more information about this proposed rule is available on the HPD website, and that's also where uh, you will find, once updates are available, they will be posted there. If you've registered your building with an email address, you'll uh, certainly those updates will be in, in bulletins that will be going out to those uh, email addresses. So uh, a recommendation is to register your building and include an email address to receive those, uh, those updates. Just to point to a couple uh, resources on the HPD website. This is the front page of the HPD website. What you'll see, you may have to scroll down a little. There's often a banner picture at the top. Um, but HPD online, uh, if you click on find building data, that will allow you to put in the address of any building in the city and look up uh, open violations, active complaints. Uh, there's a specific tab for lead-based paint violations, open lead violations, and it has a lot of information about the status of each violation. So it's a great resource if you haven't seen that already. Another plug for registering your property, make sure you, uh, you do that. And there's information there about which properties are required and which properties are just encouraged. All properties are encouraged. And then learn about safety is where you can find uh, a lot of information about very common uh, safety and um, maintenance issues that all inspectors are gonna be looking for when they go into buildings, including there is an entry there for lead-based paint. If you just want a shortcut straight to the lead-based paint, you can use this web address listed here. You've seen it already a few times, uh, nyc.gov forward slash lead hyphen based hyphen paint. Make sure you get those hyphens in there. Without the hyphens, you'll go to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's lead page. And on the page, you will see a section for owner responsibilities among other sections uh, with all of these different subsections, these different topics. I just wanna highlight these two at the bottom. Um, briefings is where you'll find uh, those, what would, would come to your email if you're registered with an email address. Um, but it has a lot of uh, current events, new developments, reminders throughout the year. Uh, so those are uh, gr a great resource to review. Even the ones that are dated older have information, doesn't mean that it's not current. Um, and also the webinar section is where you'll find recordings. This recording will be there shortly, uh, within a few days. Uh, typically, um, but you'll have recordings of old uh, previous webinars that we've done um, to uh, refer to as well. And if you have any specific questions, you can contact HPD's uh, Code Enforcement Lead-Based Paint Unit at 212-863-5501. The number again is, if you didn't get that and you wanted to write it down, it's right here. It's also available on the HPD website. But just a couple reminders that there, as I said, there's a, a, a lot of extra information uh, about other topics uh, under Local Law 1 uh, in webinar form. So check out the recordings on our website and keep checking back also to the website um, or if you're registered with an email address uh, to learn about new webinars that we're gonna do, upcoming webinars that we're gonna do uh, and how to register for those. And one final reminder that there will be a survey. We're gonna get into the Q&A in just a second, but a survey will launch as soon as we're done with that. Just a brief survey, just take a minute or two, uh, share your feedback with us, let us know uh, what we did well, what we can do better, and we certainly review all of that and try to incorporate that as best we can into our future offerings. Um, and you will be receiving a recording of this in your email, uh, usually within a day or two uh, is when that email will be automatically sent out. 
All right, and with that, we've reached our Q&A section. Uh, I've been doing a lot of talking, so I haven't really reviewed many questions, but uh, Shireen, do you have any uh, questions that are, are ready to go? Hi, Jesse, um, can you hear me? Yes. Great, and thanks everyone um, for sending in your questions. We do have um, a few of them here teed up. Please continue to send them in. I know Jesse and we have um, another colleague, Phil, in the background are gonna help um, me sort through those since I'll be answering um, most of these. Um, so please keep sending them in. Um, I do wanna start off with one general question that we have gotten multiple, multiple different ways here. And that is about um, the year built. When we're talking about pre-1960, and the presumption of lead-based paint. What we're hearing from a lot of folks, and we hear this commonly, is, well, there was a rehab done, there was a gut rehab, some people will refer to it as a gut rehab, a total rehab, they got a new certificate of occupancy. Um, this is about your original year built. So if you did a rehab and you did lead testing as a part of that rehab so that you were removing and you could show that you removed lead-based paint, then you can submit for an exemption with that paperwork. But what I'm really trying to get across is that it is based off of the year built, not based off of your year of rehab. If you did do a gut rehab, one of the easiest things that you should be able to do then, and easy, in, in relevance to everything else, um, is to hire someone to do XRF testing, which you're required to do um, anyway by 2025 of all units. And if it's pre-1960, hire someone to do the XRF testing, have them test um, all of the units and common areas and submit that for an exemption um, to HPD. We'll review that paperwork and um, if it is able to meet all the standards, issue you an exemption um, granted to those units, common areas, et cetera, whatever you submit as a part of your application. But I just wanted to make sure that it's clear to folks that pre-1960 is about your year built, not year of rehab. Um, so pre-1960, local law one still applies to that building, even if you have done a gut rehab um, you need to definitively show that there is no lead-based paint. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to perform the XRF testing. And it's required under local law one by 2025 anyway. So I wanted to touch on that first off, because I think that takes care of probably about four questions um, there together. Um, again, focus on your built, not year of rehab. Um, hopefully your rehab did remove the lead paint and your XRF testing will show that. So um, to move on to then some of the other questions that we're getting. Um, and one of the questions, um, another one from Janice, who gave us one earlier, um, talking about presumed lead paint in common areas. And she specifically asked, all three criteria must be met. So let's talk about common areas. Um, Jesse mentioned that at the very beginning, and I wanna make sure that folks do Make sure, make sure that they're aware that common areas are covered under local law one if there is a child under six residing in a unit in the building and it is pre-1960 based off of that presumption of lead-based paint or if it's built between 60 um, and 78 and the owner knows that there is lead-based paint. So common areas are covered under local law one based off of the year built and based off of a child residing in a unit in the building. Um, so the safe work practice requirements that we went over here, along with other requirements related to just your, your annual visual assessment, which is covered in a separate webinar, but I wanted to make sure that you're aware and always keeping in mind that your common areas are covered under local law one if there's a child under six residing in the building. And you can get your common areas tested to show that they are negative for lead-based paint and submit those as a part of an exemption application. So if you're considering testing units and you wanna test your common areas and make sure that that all can be removed um, under the exemption process, um, please uh, submit that with your application. Um, 
skipping past another one that's asking about gut renovation. Um, and going on to one here, um, let's see. Sorry, they're moving quickly in front of me. Um, can we ask the contractors for proof of certifications? I would say absolutely yes. You are hiring a contractor, they're required to provide you um, their certifications. And one thing that Jesse also mentioned um, when we were going through, um, there is an EPA website because EPA issues these certifications. You can look up on their website the firm name, you can look on their website. Um, they do have a database basically where you can look up the firm name, you can verify the number on the certification that a contractor gives you. You can just go on there to search what contractors in my area are um, certified to be able to um, hire someone who has the RRP certification. So you can look them up um, and you can ask contractors for their certification. I would encourage you to do so and they're required to provide that to you. Um, the question here is, there's another question from um, Strawberry um, Isaac. Uh, how can you look up your building? I'm actually not sure what that's referencing. If you are talking about looking up your building when it comes to violations, um, there's a website, HBD Online, that allows you to look up your building if you're looking for violations. But otherwise, if you want to give more clarification to your question, I might be able to help you there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next question um, from David. Um, assuming that a child under six should be living in the unit. Um, and just wanted to then provide some clarification and circle back to the definition of resides. What we're talking about here right now is safe work practices and where you're required to do those under local law one. So under local law one, a child residing in a unit triggers the requirements for safe work practices in that unit and triggers a requirement for safe work practices in the comma, common areas of that building. And be careful to not use the word live because under local law one, a child under six residing in a unit means that they spend more than 10 hours a week regularly in that dwelling unit. So that includes someone who's just visiting um, on days that add up to 10 hours a week. Um, perhaps someone who it babysits um, a relative, a child um, regularly, watches them while um, someone else goes to work that child is considered to reside under local law one. And you find out by providing your tenants the annual notice, separate webinar, but just mentioning it here, you provide them the annual notice in January of each year and it asks them specifically to identify if a child resides in that unit. So that is how you become aware don't, do not base it based off a of living. Do not just base it based off of your own knowledge. It is through that annual notice that you establish that a child under six resides. So to provide some clarification there. Um, question from Fred. Can a homeowner get these certificates? Um, can you play, please explain what needs to be done to get a certificate? Um, I would refer, refer you to the EPA website which will explain how you can get those certificates. Um, and here's what I will tell you, as far as uh, applying to get something that is an RRP certificate, the renovation repair and painting certificate, so you can do general rehab work, any sort of maintenance work that's disturbing paint, you're gonna need to get a firm license. So a license um, issued to you as a firm, and then you also need to have um, the renovator license um, for the individual staff person as well. So yes, you can go ahead and get the Safe uh, Work Practices RRP certification. Um, you do need to apply to EPA for that. You would need to get both a firm and have worker certification as well. But to provide clarification, when we were talking also about clearance, which is where you check to make sure everything is cleaned up properly after the, the maintenance work or the rehab has been done where they're taking a dust wipe and they're sending it off to the lab. 
that has to be a separate contractor not related to the owner and not related to uh, the person who has performed the work. So what you are doing is establishing, of course, that you cannot do the dust wipe. So just to make sure we're clear on when we're talking about can an owner get a certification, you can apply through EPA and get your RRP license, um, firm and worker, um, but make sure that you are hiring a separate contractor not related to you then to be doing the dust wipe. So always trying to make sure I'm giving as clear answers as possible on some of these things. Um, let's see here, going through some of the questions. Do you need to conduct, Deborah has a question, do you, do you need to conduct a dust wipe test if you have the apartment XRF tested before occupancy? Um, you're not required to just do a dust wipe test as a part of occupancy. So that's a little bit difficult for me to specifically answer that question. So I'm just gonna provide you some information. If you are XRF testing a unit and you have identified that it is negative for lead-based paint, please apply for the exemption to be issued from HPD, which would remove most of the requirements under local law one from that unit. So um, as far as just performing a dust wipe, a dust wipe is performed after you have disturbed painted surfaces above the two square feet threshold that we mentioned in a room. And it's done after that renovation or repair work to show that it, you are now having the occupant come back into a unit that is free from lead dust. So that's when a dust wipe test is performed. Primarily it is performed after a renovation or repair or an abatement that is done to show that any dust that was stirred up as a part of that has been properly cleaned, removed from the unit, and it's safe to reoccupy. But if you are XRF testing and it comes up negative, please submit for your exemption application. That, that is the way to um, uh, get an exemption from local law one. And um, next question here, Angela um, looks like she might have missed part of the, the webinar here. And she's talking about whether or not um, safe work practices that we're discussing here, or maybe local law one in general, is it for multifamily or only for, multifamily house or only for one building? Sorry, trying to read some of the question here to meet, see what she means by one building. Um, I'm not really clear on your answer, your question here, Angela, but I think you're trying to understand whether or not it's a, if it's a, this applies to one to two family units. Um, as Jesse mentioned, local law one, the turnover requirement, which again, a separate webinar, if this is the first time you're hearing about a turnover requirement, or you just wanna be able to understand more about it, we do have webinars available. Um, there's inf more information available on the website in general about turnover. The turnover requirement, which happens between occupants, has always applied to private dwellings, meaning something that is uh, one to two dwelling units. The rest of local law one, so everything we're talking about today when it comes to safe work practices, things that were mentioned about um, providing an annual notice, doing the visual assessment every single year. The law was expanded in February of this year to include all private dwellings. And that is a private dwelling where the unit is, there a unit, at least one of the units in the building is tenant occupied. So if you have a two unit building and it's occupied by the owner or um, the owner's family, then local law one does not apply. Um, but if it's a two unit building and maybe an owner lives in one unit and the other unit is occupied by someone who is not the owner's family, then local law one applies. So it is focused really on um, uh, non-owner occupied units. So I hope that was helpful to know that this does apply to private dwellings, not just um, multiple dwellings, which are standardly known as three or more units. Um, Jenny has a question 
Um, I think there's a typo, so I'm going to read it how I think it should be. Can I paint the unit by myself and hire someone to do dust white testing? Um, Jenny, you didn't give a lot of details here. So is this, if this is your own unit and you're talking about painting your own unit, then look, another one's one, one that you live in, um, then local law one does not apply. If you are an owner and you are renting out units, then you have to hire the properly certified contractor to do both the work that would be disturbing paint and then a separate contractor to do the dust wipe. So the only way that you can do work that is not covered by local law one or not covered even by federal law is like a do-it-yourselfer who's doing work in their own housing. So if you live um, uh, in a house and you are doing your own work on your own house, then the law would not apply. But otherwise, you have to hire certified contractors to do the work. So I hope that was clear. Um, in answering your question there. Um, Ruslana, um, I think there's a question here. I think this is uh, talking about gut renovation again. Um, and separate steps to do when new occupants enter. Ruslana, I think you're talking about turnover. So I just want to touch on this. It's a it's a repeat, a little bit of what I've said earlier. So if there was a gut renovation, again, it's based off of your year built, not based off of the date that you renovated. So the presumption of lead-based paint exists for buildings built prior to 1960. So all of these requirements would still apply there. Um, so I want to make sure that that's clear. And you were asking about, is there work that needs to be done before a new occupant comes in? And that's what we're talking about when it comes to turnover. That is a separate webinar that goes into the detail, but I will just mention that the basics of it are between occupants, and this needs to be done using safe work practices, hiring the certified contractors, but between occupants, you are to make sure that the unit is free of any lead paint hazards. So you're looking for peeling paint, deteriorated paint surfaces, and making sure that those are taken care of by a certified contractor. You are also required to either test and show that the window and door friction surfaces are negative for lead-based paint, or you must abate those window and door friction surfaces. And that is the general requirement. There's a few other things um, in there, but that's the general requirement that happens between occupants. I would encourage you to go and look at the more information available on the website, um, including an additional webinar talking about turnover. I can give you some more of those details. And, and Shireen, just to, uh, um, sorry everyone, but the way that the questions come in, if you, when you hit enter, that's where your question is, and then all the other questions come in below that. And so if you add something to your question <laughs> yeah. and clarify, it's way down the list. But um, just to add a, a, a corollary question to uh, that Ruslana uh, asked is, if there are no six-year-olds uh, or younger living in, in the building and none coming in on turnover, does the law still apply? And that would be, again, I encourage you to please go to the turnover information, but Jesse did also touch on this if you need to refer back to the in this webinar. Turnover, turnover is not dependent on the age of the previous occupant or the intended occupant. So turnover is that requirement that is separated from um, it needing to have a child under six involved. So any unit pre-1960 where there is a presumption of lead-based paint or any unit 60 to 78, if there's lead-based paint that is known, you are required then to do the turnover, turnover activities. It is not dependent on um, knowing that there's a child under six going to be coming to live in it. So just to be clear, that's a little bit different than some of the other requirements under local law one, which are focused on child under six units. 
Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate that as you guys are trying to catch the questions that are coming in that might be good follow-ups. I'm just trying to no go problem. through them one at a time and, and see what we can answer here because there's a lot of them coming in. Um, yep. And uh, Janice, um, uh, I, she has another question here, but I think this was already touched on. Um, painting of an apartment generally more than 100 square feet. And she was asking about, is a RRP certification still OK? So I just wanted to clarify again that what we're talking about here is two different certifications. And under local law one, it adds on the requirement that if you are disturbing more than 100 square feet in a room or you are doing work that would include the removal of two or more painted windows, then in addition to the contractor being required to be RRP, which federal law requires, local law one also wants that contractor to be an abatement firm. So you need to make sure then that you're always keeping that in mind if you are doing work that's maybe even more um, like in a, in a rehab, like say that you're replacing windows in a building and uh, you've got tenants in there while you're doing that replacement, you need to make sure then that if those are painted windows that you have a contractor that is not only RRP, but also has their abatement certification. So I know we're mentioning a lot of things here and that's why it's great that this um, webinar will be available and uh, emailed um, to everyone so that they can um, refer back to it. We will have briefings coming out um, that are um, emailed out to um, owners and managing agents who have provided their emails as a part of their registration. We do send out briefings and it, there will be one coming out soon on safe work practices, but there's a lot of information on the website um, that we hope you will continue to refer to, including this webinar, um, which I'm sure will be posted on the website and available as well. So um, thank you for your question. Um, let's see here. Um, from Chun, um, can you list, I think it's, do you have the list listing for the contractor that does lead testing? Um, I think Chun's asking about what type of contractor does lead testing. That type of contractor, the individual is Going to, they can have one of two different certificates. They can be a certified lead inspector or they can be called a certified risk assessor. The firm is going to have that same certificate, and Jesse's showing you here on the screen that lead based paint activity certificate. So EPA issues two standard firm certifications that go to the firm itself. There's the one that is the RRP, and that's people that are doing general work. Um, say a plumber is going in and they regularly are disturbing paint, that plumber is gonna need that RRP certificate because they're disturbing um, walls that could be lead-based paint. So that really deals with general repair. But the ones that, uh, the type of certificates that deal with very specific things related to lead-based paint, that falls under this lead-based paint activity certificate. So a firm that does that type of lead testing, does lead abatement, um, can take dust wipes, that firm is that firm that says lead-based paint activities certificate. That is the certificate that the firm has and the individual is either a lead inspector or a risk assessor. So I hope that helps you. And there is a database on the EPA website that can show you who is certified in the area or you can double check to make sure that a firm you're looking at does have the proper certification. So again, that's issued through EPA, I would refer you to their website. Um, a question from Jan, um, if I tell the certified workers to finish with a coat of primer, may I paint the top coats? myself. Um, this is very difficult to give you advice on because again, I would circle back to if you're going to be disturbing paint that may be lead-based paint, um, 
you're taking a chance here, Jen, is what I will say. You're taking a chance here that you are not gonna be doing work that is disturbing lead-based paint. And um, uh, this, I would caution you to make sure that you are always using certified workers, um, even if you feel that uh, the, the other, uh, you've hired a certified contractor to apply the primer, I would encourage you to make sure that you are using certified workers to do any work that's gonna be related to paint if this is not for your own personal unit. Um, let's see here. Some other questions coming in. Um, from Fern, um, Fern, hopefully you got this answer already, but uh, I'll acknowledge your question here. You're asking about how does one select an EPA certified firm? There's so many companies. You know, can you get a reference? Um, we really can't. Get, we really can't refer you to any specific firms. But again, you can find a firm that is appropriately certified by checking the EPA website. They have two separate databases, one specifically for RRP contractors and one for the more specialized lead paint surface, uh, services such as abatement, testing, dust wipe. Uh, I refer you to them because they're going to have the up-to-date certification information because this is not a one-time certification. And I want to make sure I mention that to you. You're going to see years on that certification. And um, when Jesse was showing it, it shows years on there that it is valid for. So they have to get their firm license renewed. Individuals have to get their individual license renewed. So always ask for their, um, their most recent certification and you can find the firms that have the appropriate certification um, and current certification on the EPA website. Thanks, Jesse. Oh, yep, it's showing there. Thanks for bringing that up. So it's showing the date that it was issued on and then it's showing the date that it expires. So that's, you wanna make sure um, that you're looking at that when someone provides you your their copy of their certification, that it is um, a valid and current certification. And if you ever want to double check, you can look up, you can call, there's an EPA number that you can call if you can't figure out how to use the, the database. Um, uh, but you can also enter in the number, the certificate number that's covered over here, but uh, you can enter in certificate number to confirm that the firm is appropriately certified. You can search by the firm's name. If you want to double check and make sure that their certification is valid, that's um, one way to do it there. Daniel's asking a question. Um, the question is, how does it change? Uh, I think this is, how does it change for co-ops or condo units? We do have some specific guidance. Um, we get this question a lot. So we did put some specific guidance on the website about co condos um, and co-op buildings. Thanks, Jesse. Um, there is a tab there. So I would refer you to that, but to speak very broadly about it. Local Law 1 does apply to co-ops and condo units if it, there are units in that building that are not occupied by the owner or shareholder. So that's some of the broad definition that I would give you there. Local Law 1 does apply if there are units in the building that are not occupied by the owner or the condo or the shareholder of the co-op. And you can find more information available on the website because a lot of folks think that it doesn't apply to condos and co-ops. And I always ask, are all the units only occupied by owners and shareholders? And that can give you some guidance. So I hope that helps you, Daniel. Um, Irene's asking um, a question about, does this mean the, that common areas in units are required to be tested if there's a child under six? And Irene, I think you're referring to the, we had one slide that we mentioned here, reminding you that there is a requirement. There was, it's called Local Law 31 of 2020. And that is the law that was passed that requires that all units be tested by August of 2025. So the testing requirement under that law 
does not apply to the common area. So if that is what you were referring to, that testing requirement requires to the units. Um, but I will say to you, if you um, want to apply for an exemption for like the entire building, you wanna make sure all of your units and common areas are exempt from the requirements under local law one, then yes, I would encourage you to have your common areas tested. And um, if everything's coming up negative or you've identified a few things that are lead-based paint and you wanna um, get those abated and submit your paperwork, I would refer you to the exemption process. On our website, we have a very detailed exemption application. Um, I think we still have some webinars posted about um, exemptions. Um, and yep. the units, uh, uh, the exemption units can also help you out. But there's a lot of information on there on the website about exemption. And I would encourage you, if you want to apply for exemption and test your units and include those so they're not included under local law one, then yes, please do that. Jesse, you were, you were jumping in to maybe say the webinar is up there? Uh, yes, yes, the webinar is up there. And there's also um, on the... There's a section uh, in the owner requirements uh, with uh, exemption information as well that I just highlighted on the screen. Great, thank you. Yeah, we've got a tab there specifically that talks about it. It's got the exemption application, which has pages of instructions on there that tries to answer a lot of questions. Um, and uh, that's why I would guide you. So under the required MIT to test, it's only for the units, but I would encourage you to have the common areas tested if you wanna apply for exemption. And just to jump in quickly, we have uh, we only have about three minutes left, um, so maybe another question or two, uh, Shireen. Oh, we had a lot of sure. good questions come in. I know. We have a, so many questions. A I'm ton sorry, of questions, guys, we so we yeah, so we'll we'll do our best. But this will be this will be posted, and certainly um, there is, and it's on the screen right now. Uh, if you have specific questions, the uh, lead-based paint unit, uh, their phone number is there um, for some additional information. Okay. Um, let's see, trying to uh, touch on some questions, maybe on topics that we haven't um, talked about here before, because some of these are a little bit of a repeat. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, is encasing the lead paint via like new sheetrock covering allowed? Um, that's an that's an abatement process. Um, federally, they can they call it um uh, well locally it's called um, containment. Um, federally, they you'll hear it sometimes called enclosure. Um, and yes, that's allowed. It's not something that's not allowed. Um, so just to just to be clear though, that if you are you can apply for an exemption. Sorry, let's back up. So if you find out your walls are lead-based paint. Um, and the one process that you choose to do to abate that is to um, do a containment or a conclosure, which is putting sheetrock over it. The guidance is number one, you write, put signs all over that sheetrock that you're or that plaster that you're going to cover, and you identify that it is, you know, possibly lead-based paint or is lead-based paint. And then when you're sheetrocking it, you can. Uh, apply for an exemption and you'll receive an exemption that's called a lead safe exemption. And there's two different exemption processes. One that you apply for is called lead free. And that's where lead based paint is either not in the unit or has been permanently removed. But where you are doing a process where you sheetrock over as a way of um, containing that lead based paint, you can apply for a lead safe. So um, yes, sheet rocking over is allowed um, and make sure to identify that so that if someone's breaking into that afterwards, they're aware of it and you can apply for exemption um, using that process, but you would be issued a lead safe exemption if you meet the requirements. I know we have a lot more questions um, that you know are coming in here. Um, let's see if there's anything else I can, one more, one more. Any, Jesse, um, Phil, I know you're listening in. Anything that you see that um, isn't really something we've touched on before? Um, uh, yeah, a lot of the questions are 
ones that we I mean, touched on. Of, um, yeah, this is really a lot of folks asking questions related to the certifications. So I will repeat again, you can only do work uncertified on your own unit that you live in. So any sort of work that is being done on a tenant unit or a unit that is uh, not occupied by an owner or the owner's family is required to use certified contractors. So we've gotten a variety of questions asking about, you know, can I remove that? If something tests positive, can I remove that myself? If it's your own condo units or your own, um, but again, if you're doing this for, and you live there, not that you're doing it for a tenant, then yes, but anything that involves something that is not the owner, you are required to use certified contractors. So I just wanna make sure that's very clear to folks um, um, that you are required to use certified contractors. Anything else? Okay. I think, I think we everything else is kind of touching on other topics um, as well. Yeah, and there were a lot of questions that came in um, that did touch on other areas beyond safe work practices. Um, we mentioned them a little bit during the Q&A, but there are certainly, there's a lot of resources online, so I encourage everyone, um, if we didn't get to your question, because um, we are out of time, um, to be uh, to, to go and check out the uh, other webinar recordings that we have on our website and the other resources on the Lead-Based Paint uh, website. Um, and to... Uh, stay tuned, check that website. We'll have other live webinars as well. Um, and reach out to the lead unit if you have any specific questions that didn't uh, that weren't we weren't able to answer um, here. So with that, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you, Shireen, for uh, providing us your expertise. I don't know if you have any any closing words here. I just really want to thank everyone for joining this webinar. I know it's a it's a very tough talk topic. There's a lot of information, so we appreciate you hanging in there. I hope it was helpful. Please um, complete the survey you receive afterwards. The feedback is is great for us to know um, what sort of topics, what was what was helpful for you, if this was helpful for you, what sort of topics we can do in the future. And I would encourage you to please go to the website. There's a lot of information on there. And those of you who, you know, this was your first webinar, please come back because there's a lot of good information that we try to provide you and answer your questions as you see here. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Everyone uh, be well, stay safe, and we will see you on the, during the next webinar. Take care, everybody.